So good. As Pastor Jeff said, if you are visiting this morning, we just want to welcome you. And uh, we would love for you to register your visit. Um, as Pastor Zach always says, we're not going to remind you of your extended car warranty. Uh, but we would love the opportunity to get to know you. And so uh, you can fill out a digital one, or if you received a bulletin on your way in, you can tear that perforated bottom off, and, and we'd love to get to know you. We try to be as relational as we can. And for those who are part of New Hope, we just want to say thank you for being faithful in the Lord's tithes and in our offerings and uh, in our missions giving. And uh, you guys are an incredible church. And, and if you came to give today, uh, there's several ways you can do that. And you can do that on the back, giving boxes on the walls. You uh, uh, leave, you can go online, or you can visit the app, the Vanco mobile app. Um, but I'm just going to take a moment and just pray a blessing over the offering. And uh, if, if you're visiting, this is not intended for you. Jesus, we thank you for... Uh, what you've given us, Lord, first for life in you, for the forgiveness in you, the, the, the life that you have given us, Jesus. So we praise you. And I thank you, God, for uh, finances and the provisions that you have given us. And so we, we give back to you what already was yours. And uh, we, we ask that you would bless it, that it would be stewarded wisely. And we pray for the missions dollars, that, that it would go to continue your kingdom here on earth, and that every dollar would be wisely spent and it would represent souls for the kingdom. So I pray a blessing on those who are, are, are giving today. And for those who want to give, Lord, I pray that you would, you would encourage them, that you would bless them. And, uh, and, and so, Jesus, we, we give you our offerings and we give you your tithe. We love you, Lord, in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Well, it is so good to be here, and I love Dedication uh, Sunday. I, 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 one, I love it because, um, you know, growing up in the church, I was dedicated, and uh, part of the dedication isn't just saying, yeah, I'm going to raise my family in this church, but part of it is a responsibility on the people sitting in the pews. And I look out, and even now I'm seeing so many faces that were my Sunday school teachers, that were maybe not even a classroom teacher for me, but someone that I could look up to and, and be like, that person was faithful, that person was generous, that person was always encouraging. And so uh, I appreciate uh, you New Hope family, uh, that you guys are here, that the commitment made today wasn't just a commitment up on the platform, but it's a commitment that you guys are making to these young families as, as they, they raise their children for the Lord. And uh, for those joining online, again, we just say welcome. And uh, I just want to say, it's not the same without you here. And I know, and I'm very grateful for online services, and I'm very grateful uh, that, that we can um, have that option. But if, if you're just maybe hit the snooze one time too many, or you can be here at all. Man, we just want to invite you here. The spirit in this place is so warming and welcoming, and uh, there's something special when the body of believers come together. It's one thing to worship the Lord in your car with your own songs in your own time, but there's something special that happens when we not forsake the gathering together, the assembles, uh, the, the assembly of the saints as the day draws near. So we are continuing in our series, Stories of Hope. How many have enjoyed that this week or these past few weeks? I'm glad half of you have enjoyed it. Um, and uh, we're, we're going to have an amazing testimony this morning of the Lord, of what he has done in a very special couple's life. Um, and, and it has to do with finding freedom finding hope through forgiveness. And this is an incredible testimony, and we'll get to that in, in just uh, a, a moment. But before we do, and we, we talk about this story of forgiveness, I just want to talk a little bit about what forgiveness is. And in order to do that, I want to talk first about what forgiveness is not, because I believe that society and the world has painted forgiveness as being something that it's not. And so if you're taking notes, which I would highly encourage you to do, um, I, I hope that uh, these truths will help us in the process of forgiveness. Forgiveness is not a one-time event. It's not just this one thing. It's, it can be a process. It can be like an onion, and you peel it back layer by layer. I believe that this morning, wholeheartedly, the Lord might take a layer or two or three off, but tonight I believe that there's going to be even more. And so I would encourage us all to be open. And so this morning, forgiveness is not saying what happened uh, or what they did is okay. Okay? 
That, that is not forgiveness. That's a lie that the enemy likes to throw our way and say, if you forgive them, you're just condoning what they did. You're just saying that what they did was okay. And, and uh, that, that, that is something that Satan will keep you to prevent you from living in freedom. Your offender will be held responsible for what they did to you. And, and if not on earth, it will happen in heaven. And I would encourage you in, in this sense too, if, if uh, I received this advice um, from one of my counselor friends this morning, uh, that's here this morning, uh, and, and she said that if, if the offender did something that's illegal, you need to report that. Um, but, but sometimes I, I believe that, uh, this lie of saying that if you forgive them, it's just saying what they did was okay. It stems from this feeling of, of, uh, wanting to, to be judge and ruler as if you are going to be the one who puts the consequence on them. Forgiving involves trusting God with uh, a person's consequences of their sin. Instead of us trying to punish them uh, by withholding forgiveness, we trust God. Romans twelve nineteen says this, do not take revenge, my dear brothers, but leave room for God's wrath. For it is written, it is mine to avenge, I will repay, says the Lord. We don't need to worry about getting even. We don't need to worry about revenging ourselves because we have a God who is just and he is fair. And even if it seems as though they are getting away with it here on earth, they will be held accountable either here or in heaven. The second thing that forgiveness is not is acting like nothing happened, like sweeping it into the rug, under the rug. I think that this is a very common thing that happens in, in marriages, especially Midwest marriages. You know, maybe if you're, you're Greek or you're on the East Coast, you just let it all out and it's like, we're going to duke it out. But here it's just like, let's just not talk about it for a couple days and we'll just let this, this settle. That's a, that is a recipe for disaster. That, that is, uh, leaves room for this accumulation of bitterness, of frustration to eventually this, this accumulating event where it's the straw that broke the camel's back. It's the small thing that didn't happen in the marriage that boom, it explodes. Um, a wound will not properly heal unless it's first addressed. So acting like nothing happened is not a biblical thing, uh, a biblical viewpoint. Uh, Matthew chapter 18, verse 15, gives a clear uh, scriptural point of reference of what to do when someone offends you. And it says this, if your brother sins against you, go and show him his fault just between the two of you. And if you continue to read in Matthew 18, it gives us a clear plan for forgiveness. If we choose to ignore it, there becomes this potential buildup. So we can't just act like nothing happened. The third thing that forgiveness is not, is it's not a feeling. Forgiveness is not a feeling. If we allow our feelings to, to dictate our lives, we're going to live a very up and down life, right? How many know that feelings lie? The older I get, I still feel like I'm young, but my body says maybe not so much. I went biking with my son and his best friend and his dad and I was doing some jumps and some different things and today I'm like where's the aspirin? Where's the Advil? You know? Feelings lie to us. In fact the, the prophet Jeremiah in Jeremiah 17 9 says that the heart is deceitful above all things. The heart is, de follow your heart is the biggest bull honky I've heard. It's bad. Don't follow your heart because it will lead you into, into trouble. It, forgiveness is not a feeling. Forgiveness is also not reconciliation. What is reconciliation? Reconciliation is healing or restoring a relationship. I want you to hear me on this. Forgiveness has to do with the condition of your heart. Reconciliation has to do with the condition of your relationship. Forgiveness has to do with the condition of your heart. Reconciliation has to do with the condition of your relationship. Reconciliation might be the end goal, but it requires the, the cooperation of two parties. It, it requires, and if those two parties are unequally yoked, if, if there's someone who's just not on the same wavelength, that they're not godly, that they, there's no intention of restoring and repairing that relationship, 
That's okay. Nowhere in Scripture does it say that you have to be best friends with the person who offended you. In fact, Romans 12, 18, verse before 19, it says, If it is possible, as far as it depends on you, live at peace with everyone. It says, If it is possible. Guess what, church? Sometimes it's not always possible. Anybody in that situation right now where it's like, I've done everything that I can to be in a relationship and it's just not. You don't need to feel guilt because forgiveness is about the condition of your heart. Reconciliation is about the condition of the relationship. You understand? Forgiveness also, number five, is not waiting for an apology. It's not waiting for an apology. Uh, think of Jesus on the cross. In, in, in Luke chapter 23, I believe in verse 34, he says, Father, forgive them for their sins, for they know not what they're doing. D- did Jesus wait until the Romans, until the religious leaders were saying, oh, we're so sorry, Jesus. We made a mistake, Jesus. Or did he just forgive them in that moment? Forgiveness is not waiting for an apology. And lastly, and this is, this is the most important thing, thing of of what forgiveness is not this morning is it's not an option it's not an option it's it's a command it's a mandate it's something that christ has extended to us and therefore we are to extend it to them a few verses to write down ephesians 4 verses 31 through 32 says this get rid of all bitterness rage and anger brawling and slander along with every form of malice i'm going to read that verse again get rid of all bitterness of all rage and all anger. Those are some strong emotions that come with resentment, that come with unforgiveness. And he's saying, get rid of it. In verse 32, he says, be kind and compassionate to one another, forgiving each other just as in Christ, God forgave you. Matthew chapter six, this is to me one of the most scary verses in all of the New Testament and Jesus' words on the Sermon on the Mount. And he says this, these are Jesus' words, for if you forgive other people when they sin against you, your heavenly Father will also forgive you. But if you do not forgive others their sins, your Father will not forgive your sins. Forgiveness is not an option, church, church. And some of you are feeling that pushback from the enemy and saying, well, you don't understand, Pastor Austin, because you don't understand the depth of my hurt. You don't understand what they did to me, and then I forgave them, and then they did it to me again, and then I forgave them again, and it was repeated and repeated and repeated. You cannot even begin to understand what I am holding on to, what has happened to me. You're right. I, I might not be able to relate. I might not be able to empathize. I might not be able to, but there is a God who can. There is a God that, that his love runs deeper than the deepest parts of your hurt. And forgiveness is not an option. But this is the good news. You say, how do I forgive if, if I, I, I can't? Like, I, I just, I feel I can't. Christ will fill you. Christ will help you. His Holy Spirit will guide you. He, he, he will pour out his mercy and his love. And every day, he will begin to peel that onion and just pull a layer, a pull a layer, and it'll get easier and easier. He's not asking you to forgive in your own strength, and your own power. He's asking that you would make him the center of your life, the center of your attention, to, for his spirit to come in and to fill you up so that you can live in freedom. This is important stuff. In 1 John one uh, verse nine, it says, if we confess our sins, if we confess our sins, he is faithful and just and will forgive us our sins and purify us from all unrighteousness. I personally believe that unforgiveness is one of the greatest vices that the enemy has on his people. I I believe that, um, as I said earlier, forgiveness is not just this one-time event where you just say, I forgive, and then it's just over. Oftentimes, it requires a process. And tonight, I hope that you'll come back as, as we look to Scripture, as we look to some practical resources, how to move forward into freedom, move forward into healing, move forward in, into a, a, a forgiven uh, state of your heart. Um, but this morning, I would just ask that you would be open and you'd be sensitive And right now, just asking the Lord, is there anyone in my heart that I need to forgive? 
this is going to sound so silly. I, I'm embarrassed to even share it. I probably already shared it at some point. But I had to forgive a cop one time, state trooper. He pulled me over, and I told him why I was speeding, which was because my potty training son said he needed to go, and so I had to get over three lanes of traffic, and so I gunned it to get around, and he didn't believe me. And, and I've, I was like, you're challenging my heart, you know? And I, it took me a long time before I could drive past the East Mixmaster before I was like, oh, that officer, oh, oh. How silly is that? But, but is there anything in your life where you're upset with someone and you don't even really remember what you're upset with them about? Is there unforgiveness that has been harbored in your heart and will you allow the Lord to lead you this morning, to fill you to a place of freedom? Man, that is my heart this morning. It's not to glorify Jared and Becky. It's not to glorify a testimony. It's to point us to Christ because it's only through his strength that you can find freedom. Forgiven people forgive others. And if you've experienced the forgiving hope of Jesus Christ, then it is our duty, it's our obligation to forgive others. Oh, one speaker put it this way, he says, the greatest act of love was that a man lays down his life, why? For the forgiveness of sins. That could be said that the opposite, the greatest act of hate is actually withholding forgiveness. When you forgive others, you are acting the most Christ-like that you can possibly act because he forgives us daily. He loves and he forgives. But when we withhold forgiveness, we're acting more like Satan than ever before. Help us, Jesus. Help us in this moment. Help us, Jesus. And at the end, this is the call and this is the response. I'm gonna ask those who have been prompted by the Spirit to say, there's someone who I need to forgive in humility to stand where you're at publicly. I'm not gonna have people's, uh, eyes closed at this time to stand up. Why? Because that's punching Satan in the face and that's saying, no longer am I going to be held captive of the chains of unforgiveness and the bitterness and the rage and the hate in my heart, but I'm going to move forward and I'm going to step into my freedom in Jesus' name. And so I want you to be ready to stand on your feet. And I believe that that's going to be a big layer of uh, in your step of process. So this morning, I want to invite my best friend, Jared Atchison and his wife, Becky Atchison, and they have got an incredible testimony of how God has helped them forgive over the process of many, many years, 15 years. So would you bring a warm welcome to Jared and Becky as they come. We've got our nice little living room set up here. This is nice. They brought their water bottles. And, and um, Jared and I... Uh, so uh, those who don't know the history of the church, uh, Dale Atchison helped my dad start this church. He was one of the original uh, handful of people that were crazy enough to believe my dad, let's start a church. And uh, so I have literally known Jared every day of my life, and I consider him my best friend. He's one of our deacons, and uh, Jared and Becky both are deeply involved in the heartbeat of this church. They help, Jared serves on the deacon board. Uh, Becky helps in coffee in the women's ministry. They both serve as youth leaders. You name it, they've done it. And they're willing to scrub toilets. They're willing to share their testimony. And uh, I'm just consider myself very blessed to have you up on the screen as a picture of, of their family from last summer. And uh, Brooklyn, who is 14. Bryce, who is 11. 12. He's 12. He's an old man. And, uh, and Kale, who is nine. And uh, I'll quick just uh, share a, a fun story. Jared and Becky got married very young and uh, at 19 years old, right? Yep. Any other 19-year-olds get married out here, right? Anybody, like, still wasn't in puberty at 19 years old, right? Like, okay. Um, and uh, I remember I'm, I'm, I was 16 or I was 17 years old at the time. They got married, and I was in their wedding, best man, and you know, doing different things, and, and uh, about a month and a half after they got married, Jared calls me up, and he goes, I got a problem. I said, what? He goes, we're pregnant, and I'm thinking to myself, why are you calling a 17-year-old <laughs> right now? What am I going to say? 
I was uh, desperate. I was desperate. Oh, you're, you're, you were desperate. Yeah, you were desperate. <laughs> so, um, but I, I value you guys, and uh, I've asked them to just write down some notes because this is about 15 years in process, so they've got some notes here, and uh, thank you for being here. So, Becky, would you just share with us just a little bit of your upbringing and just some of the experiences um, that you had, and, and we've got your, you've got our attention this morning. So when Austin first asked me to share my testimony, um, I was really nervous, and not just to stand in front of you, because I, at this point in my life, I've become an open book. You know, I've allowed God to work through me, and I've shared this with you know different youth students and different small groups of women. But what's the hardest for me is to sit here, I knew I'd cry right away, knowing that there's people here who may be holding on to unforgiveness, maybe not quite like mine, but even just a little unforgiveness and realizing what it's keeping you from, the kind of freedom that you could have. And I sit here today feeling fully free. Thank, thank you, Jesus. And no longer feel the weight of what happened in my childhood. And I'm just going to pray real quick. Jesus, I just thank you for allowing us to share your testimony. Not my testimony, but what of you did through me. God, I thank you for the years that you have stayed with me, God. And I pray that you would just speak to each person in this room, God, of where it is that they need to forgive and help them to see the kind of freedom that they can have if they truly give everything to you, Jesus. In your name, amen. So my parents and I, we grew up in Minnesota in a small rural town. And my parents divorced when I was one. My dad struggled with alcohol, and that was the reason for the, the divorce. I had one brother who was from that marriage, and then my parents both got remarried. So then I had two other brothers and one sister. And my mom also struggled with alcohol, and she hid that alcohol very well from us. Most of our childhood, we didn't really know what was going on. She also was very depressed, and uh, she was very good at hiding that until she, I was about seven years old when she had a relapse from being sober for many years. Um, basically, when she started having kids, she stopped drinking because she knew that those effects. So she was sober for many years and then had a relapse. And she was taken to a rehab facility. And so I was, at that time, I was living with my stepdad, and we didn't have a good relationship. I really didn't have a good relationship with many males in my life, and I'll share why coming up. Um, but during that time she was in rehab, she had to go to therapy, and things were brought up from her childhood of things she was going through to try to help her heal through her process, and then things started coming up from our own childhood, and it was through a series of events of te actually testifying. I was testifying in court was the first time that I told somebody about um, the sexual abuse that had happened when I was younger. And I didn't tell anybody until then. I didn't tell my mom, I didn't tell my sister. Nobody knew. And actually my, sis my sister at the time was a couple years younger than me and she's actually the one who was brave enough to say something first. And that's when I found out that it had also been happening to my sister. And part of the reason um, my mom was struggled with alcohol and earlier in, or in her high school years with drugs and depression just um, really gripped our home. And I didn't realize why all this stuff was happening up until seven 
and so there was just so much darkness and depression going on um, within our home because of those things. And thankfully, I can say today that my parents are different, that they found Jesus, and they no longer struggle with those addictions. Yeah, praise God. So um, when, when did the abuse uh, first start? And can you walk us through just the emotions, the feelings, you know, what, what was kind of going through uh, just as you walked in, in that dark season? It first started um, when I was about five. And my cousins would babysit us quite a bit, my teenage cousins. My parents would be working late or they'd be away. And my cousins lived just across the field. So it was really easy for them to babysit us all the time and, and sometimes even just coming over. Um, but during those times that they would come over or we would go to their house to be babysat, and usually it was my older girl cousin who would babysit us, but her brothers would always be there. And that's when those sexual acts took place and they would make me do sexual acts to them and even um, an attempted rape. And I had no idea that it was wrong. My parents never told me this kind of love, this isn't love. This is not the way you should be treated. Um, so I just hit it and I felt, I felt so guilty when I first testified and I was like, why did I never stop this? And I was, felt guilty that I didn't make it, let it stop for my sister as well, who also had to go through this and she was younger than me. Every time we'd go to a family gathering, or I'd be together with my, my cousins. I'd feel so ashamed, um, and I'm just embarrassed that it happened, I, and I didn't know why. Um, it, I started slowly then, just slowly started going into depression, just like my mom did, um, feeling so damaged and broken, and, and just not knowing um, how I really needed to be loved. And when I was seven, when it first came out, the abuse then was no longer happening, thankfully. And he, my cousin was brought to court. But at that point, I still didn't know how to be set free. So at what point did you realize that forgiveness was necessary to, to move on and to heal? Um, my mom, when she got out of rehab, uh, but that time I was about eight years old, she had a friend who she reconnected with who started attending Assembly of God Church, and she really got to see who Jesus really was and having a relationship with Jesus. And it wasn't just a religion, a ritual that she was so used to growing up. That's how she went to church was just for religion. And it was more about having the relationship. And it was during a revival service at our church that my mom accepted Jesus and then I accepted Jesus the night after her. And in that moment, I just felt just a weight lifted off my shoulders and I, I felt a sense of hope. Um, yeah, thank you, Jesus, that, you know, I, I felt that hope. And <laughs> most people would think, oh, well, you found Jesus, that you're, everything's gonna be better. Well, it wasn't. The attacks actually got worse. I, you know, the spiritual attacks. I was constantly feeling angry. I was um, struggling with so many different things and I couldn't figure out why. Why did I still have to feel all these things? And I knew where my hope was. I knew that Jesus had saved me, but why am I still feeling like this? And I was just, I was so desperate, feeling so desperate. And it was actually, when I was in high school, I had a serious relationship that I thought I was gonna marry that person. And it ended kind of abruptly, right around the time that my grandpa passed away. And it sent me into really deep depression from then. And even to the point of having suicidal thoughts. And I was at youth group one night and my youth pastor had said a sermon on forgiveness 
and he was talking about how to forgive is to set a prisoner free and discover that the prisoner was you. And I was like, wow, that's me. And I instantly, I knew that that was the changing point that I, he's not, there's nothing that's happening to him right now. Maybe there was and now there's not. But I'm the one who's still living in this pain. And I knew that I wanted to be free from it. And God started to show me that the more I spend time with him, coming back to him and, and finding that f- love of Jesus and finding who he was and how he loved me and just over and over the next uh, few months to a year, I would continue to walk in that. And then that's when I met Jared too. Wow, that's beautiful. So, so what I'm hearing you say is that it wasn't really until you started to, to dive into a deeper relationship with Christ, but when that took place, you felt like things kind of got worse before they got better. Now, yeah. I was there uh, when you guys first met at Lake Geneva, and uh, you guys were playing hacky sack, um, or we were playing hacky sack, and Jared's a wrestler. And uh, wrestlers don't play hacky sack. So I don't know what she saw in him. Uh, but, but Jared, um, t- tell us, uh, when, you, when you learned about Becky's past trauma and the, the sexual abuse, um, what, what was your initial reaction to, to that? Yeah, so we, we met in uh, 2006. Am I on? Am I on? All right. So we met in 2006, and I was shocked at first. Um, I had just met this this wonderful girl, and she it was love at first sight, and she begins right away sharing some of uh, not only this story but some other some other things that that had happened as well. And it was at first a sense of shock because we come from very different backgrounds. She knows dysfunction, hurt, pain. I come from a place of stability. My parents have been married for well over 40 years and grew up in church. We come from very different backgrounds. And so I knew that these kinds of things happened, but this was the first time I'd ever been this up close and personal. Um, And what I also found uh, incredible, and as the weight of this would continue to come out the the closer we got, but she never spoke a bad word of those people. Not once. Not once said, I hate them, I I wish the worst for them. She never once did that. And so I'll just add this, that you can can harbor unforgiveness and never speak a bad word. Like Austin said, it's about your heart. And as we got closer, I began to become angry. I wanted justice. I had a broken heart of compassion for her, but that that heart of compassion began to turn to anger. And I began to pick up a secondary offense. I began to feel offended for her. And I, I think that many times it's much easier to pick that offense up and where I feel like I, I want to have justice for her. And especially as a male, I felt like I, I needed to protect her and I, I wanted to, to serve justice. And as, we, as our relationship grew, uh, this became more personal. It became more of a personal offense, a firsthand offense, as now I felt like something had been taken from me. Um, and as we got, uh, when we got married in 2008, um, she was beginning to heal, but there was still a lot of unresolved trauma. A lot of things that, that were still buried and that I'm finding out more and more as we talk and as, as we're learning more about each other. And uh, this unresolved trauma began to affect our intimacy. And my compassion quickly turned to anger, to bitterness, to rage, to even hate, because now I feel like I'm robbed. 
and you took something from me. And I remember many nights of uh, even blaming her at times, of being angry, bitter, all because I was withholding unforgiveness. So at what point did you come to just a realization that forgiveness was the clear path to freedom? I started to get tired of the strife, uh, the arguments, the just the strife between Becky and I. It was it was pulling us apart. Um, it was killing me inside. And I, I remember uh, one moment in, so we got married in 2008, 2010, uh, we were on our way to a 90th birthday party for her grandma. And going, driving up to Minnesota, I fought her the entire way. I don't want to go. I don't want to be here because all three of her abusers were going to be there. And I had met them once before, but that I was going to have to spend some extended time and I didn't want to go. And I remember pulling into the driveway and, and I'm still fighting with her. I said, I'll drop you off. I'll drive back to your mom's house. I'll just stay there and hang out. And she goes, no, my grandma wants you there. You're going to be there. So that made me feel kind of good. Her grandma loved me and you know, what's not to like, right? And and so, okay. And so I asked her one more time. I'm stubborn. I said, I don't want to go. She looked at me and she said, Jared, she said, if I have forgiven them, then you have no reason why you can't. And I, and I said to her, I said, that's not fair. That's not fair. You can't, you can't say that. I've got a right to be upset. They took something from me. They hurt you. And I was reminded in that moment of Matthew 6, where if you don't forgive, you won't be forgiven. And the scary thing about unforgiveness is in that moment, about unforgiveness is in that moment, knowing that scripture, I was willing to say, no, I don't want to forgive. I'm not going to forgive. I'm, I'm willing to put my own forgiveness on the line so that I can be hurt. That's where I was. But that began a, and we went to, to the event. Uh, I obeyed the Holy Spirit and my wife. But, uh, and I was cordial, but that was, that was very difficult to swallow that. Uh, but that began a seven-year process where God began to soften my heart and was and would remind me of what I'd been forgiven of. Man, that's so beautiful because uh, you see Becky's process as she's progressing in forgiveness, taking steps towards freedom. It was actually that that pushed you t to uh, you know your forgiveness moment. Um, and, and I would just encourage you, like that that might be you this morning, where you can look and you can say, "Man, if I've seen that." Why can't I? Um, so, Jared, why don't you, or Becky, uh, what was your process, or what was the process of you for forgiving your cousins? Um, it was an actually, it was actually a really long process. You know, I thought, I thought that as soon as I chose to forgive after that one night at service, that it would all go away, and. I constantly was reminded of of the past events and images and thoughts. And every time I would spend time with Jesus, I would pray that he would cleanse my mind, that he would take away the memories. And I had to ask God to help replace those thoughts and replace those images and be able to stand on God's promises. Because I, he, through spending more time with him, I began to know those promises in my heart and I needed to replace them. Every time a thought or image would come, I'd replace it. I just keep doing it over and over again. And the more time I spent with Jesus, he kept filling the brokenness and taking away the pain. And 
I just kept falling more in love with Jesus. And he also helped me to realize that he also loved my cousins. That was another big, big thing for me was he loved them and he also died for them. And it wasn't them that I should hate, but the, but the sin that was holding their life. And I also wrote a letter at one point in my journey. I wrote a letter to them telling them that I forgave them. To this day, I still haven't gotten a letter or if, I'm sorry, I haven't gotten an apology back. And I'm okay with that. And I think everyone here needs to be okay with that because it's, it's not needed for your forgiveness. It's not needed to be set free. Um, the biggest thing for me was not relying on those feelings when I felt hurt, when I felt ashamed and broken, is I had to choose daily, if not hourly sometimes, to forgive them. I constantly had to be forgiving them. And I constantly had to be see, asking God to show me how he sees them and having that be a reminder over and over again. And then later in life, I started, uh, you know, helping with the youth group and knowing that God was going to use my testimony to help other uh, youth students. I've, I've shared my testimony with lots of youth students. Um, and I know that God now has a purpose through that pain that he's been using me in that position. And now I help a lot with human trafficking stuff and knowing that that, that just kills me, knowing that there's other girls and even boys that are, are stuck in this and they constantly are having to deal with this and they're not free. And, they don't, and have, most of them don't even know Jesus. And so that's where my passion comes for human trafficking. If nobody knows, why, why does Becky put on the 5K every year? That's, that's why. Um, it's because of my past, but you can use your past to turn it into a passion. And that helps you. Another way that helps you get through the pain that you're in, seeing somebody else maybe set free too. And that's why I'm here today is to, to hope that through sharing my story that you also can find forgiveness and it can help other relationships around you. And I don't know how many relationships it's helped me walking through this pain, uh, multiple relationships, both back in my childhood and now. I can, I'm, I'm pretty quick to forgive. It's, it, it's pretty, you know. You'd have to be married to Jared. I, I got to be able to forgive Jared. <laughs> but no, it's, it's really helped. And, and honestly, I don't know what, if I went to walk through that, I don't know what that would be like. And one last thing is, you know, many of you in here may be sitting in my shoes that I did back in high school thinking, how do I forgive them? And, and maybe you're frustrated. Maybe you're, you're mad at God for allowing that to happen. Um, but I want to challenge you, don't, don't give up. Because if I would have given up, I wouldn't be the person that I am today. And you won't be the person that God wants you to be. Just imagine the kind of life that you could have from feeling fully free and yeah. fully released of all unforgiveness. And maybe tonight you need to come back and lay it all at the altar. And maybe Monday and Tuesday and Wednesday, you need to keep coming to Jesus and keep giving it to him. It's not... It's not just a, a one-time thing. It's, it's a continual process of forgiving them. It's beautiful. Jared, real quickly, can you just talk um, about the event in 2017 that led to you forgiving your cousins? Yeah, so I was, I was even frustrated as I began to see her heal. I'm still in this prison. I'm still harboring these things. But in 2017, we went to... Uh, a funeral for Becky's uncle, <clears throat> uh, who happened to be uh, their father. And as we're visiting with other people and we're beginning to walk towards the car, uh, the Holy Spirit stops me and he says, stop, 
turn around and go tell him that you, that you love him and that you're praying for him. Now there was three abusers, but there was one that was the main perpetrator and that's where most of my anger and bitterness was at, was against him. And I didn't argue with God, I just said, no, I'm not doing that, no. And uh, I began to walk towards the car and he says, now, turn around. And again, I said, no. And I began to, I'm still having conversations and I walk towards the car and he says, stop now. If you want to be free, do it now. And in that moment, I knew I must, I have to do this. And so I said, I told Becky, I said, there's something I have to do. And I turned around and when I turned, when I made a conscious decision to turn, I don't know what happened, but God began to soften my heart. And for the first time, as I looked at him 30 yards away, I began to see the pain that he was in. And I walked over to him and I said, I didn't mention anything in the past. I just said, I want you to know that I love you and I'm praying for you. And I gave him a hug and he began to tear up. I don't know what he was thinking that moment, but when I, when I said those words, there was a weight that was lifted off of me. And I knew in that moment that I was free. And it wasn't excusing what had been done. And I think what's so, that what makes it even more powerful is you don't forget what was done, but you knowing what had happened, I forgive you anyway. And at that moment, I was free because I chose to turn. And if you're in this place and you're withholding forgiveness, don't wait. Do it now. Thank you guys so much for being vulnerable this morning. And uh, I just praise God for this testimony. This testimony is not to elevate Jared and Becky, but it's to elevate our Lord and our Savior because it's clearly through his strength that they have the power to forgive. Can we show some appreciation to Jared and Becky this morning? In uh, just a moment, we're going to end, and if you've been just feeling that gentle tug on your heart, that you know that there's unforgiveness in your heart, I'm going to ask that you're going to stand. And I believe in that moment, it's going to be a, a declarative moment that says, no longer, Satan, are you going to hold me in bondage? No longer, Satan, are you going to have chains on me? But I'm going to walk forward in the example that Jesus Christ, my Lord and Savior, set for me and walk forward in forgiveness. I'm going to choose to forgive. I'm going to choose to forgive. Would you just close your eyes and bow your heads across this place? Jesus, we thank you. Just right now, we thank you, Jesus. We thank you for the forgiveness. Reminded of the song, Living Hope, that we sang. There's power in your name that you break every chain. And so this morning, we thank you. We thank you, God, that we have been forgiven. We thank you, God, that you choose to no longer hold against us our sins and our transgressions. God, I thank you for this story of hope. I thank you for the freedom that has been found. This morning, we turn to you our hope our strength, our freedom, our redeemer. I pray right now for the individual that feels that their pain goes deeper than your love, that those lies would just be pulled off, that their eyes would be opened right now in this moment to just how much you love them. Would you begin to open up their heart, soften their heart, Jesus? Is there any unforgiveness in your heart as we search as Jesus? I believe that the Spirit of God is speaking to some right now, the same thing that he spoke to Jared, where he says, stop, and if you want to be free, forgive them and do it now. If you want to be free, 
do it now. Don't wait for an apology. Don't wait for your emotions to catch up. Do it now if you want your freedom. Your freedom is right before you. Your healing is right before you. Your peace is right before you. Don't wait. Don't resist my love. Don't resist my grace. Do it now. I can see it now. I can see marriages taking steps towards health. I can see friendships being restored. I can see weights that have been carried for decades being lifted off of people's shoulders. As, as you strengthen us, God, help us in our flesh. Help us in our weakness. Don't wait. Do it now. Your freedom is before you. And so right now, if you'd say that there is forgiveness that needs to take place and I need to forgive, would you stand to your feet in three, two, one? Would you stand right now all across this place boldly saying, there's someone, there's something that's happened and I choose to forgive. And I choose to forgive. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Can everyone in the room say this? I will forgive. Come on, everyone in the room say, I will forgive. I will forgive as Christ forgave me. I will forgive as Christ forgave me. Would you stand all to your feet? And if someone stood by you, would you just pray for them as I pray? Lord, right now, I pray that there would just be a release, that this would be one step in the process, that there would be healing, that there would be love, that your forgiveness would flow, that there would be freedom found in you, Jesus. I pray that this would not just be um, a, a moment, but this would be a, a, a catapult that launches us towards healing, that launches us towards wholeness. And so I pray, Lord, for those who have been holding on to things and they've come fused, they, they, they've made it a part of their identity that they would begin to believe the identity that you have spoken over their life. And I pray that we would walk as forgiven children and we would forgive those who have sinned against us. Thank you, Jesus. Give us the strength to forgive. And just continue with your eyes closed and head bowed. If there's anyone here that would say, I have yet to receive forgiveness from my Lord and Savior. I don't know that I would wake up in heaven if I were to die tonight. I don't, I don't know that I've ever asked God to forgive me of my sins and I realize I'm not in a right relationship with him. First John 1 verse 9 says, if we confess, he is faithful. God is faithful. There is nothing that you have done that can keep you from the love of our Savior. He is not standing there wanting to punish you. He's wanting to, to embrace you as a loving, perfect father would. And so if there's anyone here this morning that would say, I need the forgiveness of Jesus Christ and I'm asking him to be Lord and Savior, would you just raise your hand and look at me this morning? Yes, 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 yes. Is there any others? Jesus, I pray for these three hands, Lord. I pray, God, that your Holy Spirit would enter them, that they would receive the forgiveness. Whatever the stain of sin that Satan keeps on throwing in people's minds and their hearts, I pray that they would just visually see it right now being cleansed and wiped clean, God, that they would begin to see themselves the way that you see them. And so I pray as they declare with their mouth and they confess with their mouth and they believe in their heart that you are Lord, that you have all authority in heaven and on earth, that we trust you with our salvation, we trust you with our life, and I pray right now that they would experience the peace of salvation, the peace of forgiveness in you, Jesus Christ, our Lord and our Savior. Amen, amen. I want you real quick before we leave, I know this is a heavy subject, um, and I praise God, but I believe that for some of you this morning that stood, or maybe you didn't stand, that this morning was a morning where the Lord broke down some walls that the enemy had built in your mind and in your heart. But if you see in the, the, the theme of, of Jared and Becky's testimony 
they were constantly in the presence of Jesus. They were constantly going back to the foot of the cross. They were constantly in the presence of Jesus. And for some of you, you feel a little bit better. You're gonna walk out feeling a little bit better. Don't settle. There are more layers. There's more of a process. Come back tonight. I'm gonna be talking about practical ways to forgive. And, and there's some really good stuff as I've done some research, as I've some, talked to some professionals. And, and I would really encourage you, come back tonight. And even even if you don't feel like you have unforgiveness in your heart, come be in the presence of Jesus. He's our healer. He's our peace. He's our strength. And God bless you. And please be back tonight. For those joining online, thank you for joining. Go find a Sunday school class, hug a neck, and may the peace of Jesus be with you.